Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the impact of aspect on detectability and how you can kind of manipulate it a little bit in order to uh, be able to detect or not be detected. So what we've done here is we grab ourselves a P-37, who's um, old school Russian radar, early 1960s technology. I really like it because it's got a really, really, really high transmit power, which also gives it the stupid range of uh, 250 nautical miles, which let's be realistic. It's probably instrumented to probably 200, but ah, it's all good kind of a thing like that. Plus not to mention the earth is curved and like if you've ever zoomed out all the way, yeah, we'd like to see this radar see over this curvature here, but ah, not gonna worry about it today. So what we're gonna do is that we have a bunch of different targets in this environment and I wanna detect them one by one and go ahead and try to figure out what's going on as I do my detections. So to make my life simpler, I'm actually gonna go up to game options here, I'll go up to message log. Do you see this thing here that says new air contact and this is option for time scale 1X? I'm actually gonna click both of these check boxes here so it raises a balloon and it slows my game down. Uh, this is one of those things I feel like I should have done a video on a long time ago, because this is really, really helpful if uh, you're keeping an eye out for specific new targets before you get whacked by a vampire or something like that. And again, it's not that vampire, haha, <laughs> I want to suck your blood. It's the you know, typical unidentified incoming missile sort of a thing like that. So let's go ahead and unpause and boop. And we can see we instantaneously get a bunch of new contacts here, which is what I expected. Now we have one kind of over here. Uh, keep in mind, in order to identify a track, you have to make the radar go around twice. Uh, as you can see here, three seconds have passed, and I picked out all those tracks here. But if you're curious how long it's going to take me to get targeting range and speed information, you can go ahead and hit the radar itself, and you'll probably notice it's scan interval 10. So it takes 10 seconds to come back around again. So theoretically, at 13 seconds of our scenario here, we should automatically get another whack of these, and then our folks will actually sit there and start running the math. Ready, set, look at that. Perfect. So now we have a bunch of tracks. So we have 350 knots here. We have this chap over here. We have somebody, what is this, about uh, 211 nautical miles. Man, that's a long distance away. Uh, we pick these ones that are kind of flying away, uh, kind of doing donuts, and then like these two seem to be flying away from us. So go ahead and speed up time. Watch, whoop, did you see that? Did you see that? It automatically brought us back down to 1x speed and it instantly identified our new contact who was chilling over here. Uh, the reason this is so helpful here is because we noticed the range was about, you know, 350 knots. And they seem to be about 214, 211 miles away, which is pretty darn good. So let's go ahead and speed up time again. Oh, new contact. Notice how handy this little bubble is, by the way. Great little tool. And we've got a new one. Um, this one seems to be interesting. It's about 210 nautical miles, and uh, we didn't pick them up. Radar came around and illuminated them again. We're picking them up at 350 knots and about uh, 36,000 feet. So at speed up time. Oh, we got another one. And let's see here, we picked that particular target up at 210. We picked this particular target up at 207. That was a three nautical mile difference. Uh, meanwhile, these other two that have been running away from us the whole time are doing a pretty good job of it. So what's going on here? Well, let's uh, put on God's eye real fast and take a peek. What we can see here is a wide variety of different aircraft. Um, coming over here, this is an F-104S. <laughs> and this one, of course, is an F-16 because F-16. Now, if I actually click on one of these database entries and you scroll down a teeny tiny bit, you'll notice that we have a great little detail that's going to be providing us what we need to know as far as detectability, depending on kind of what we set our particular aircraft up to. You know, if I come down here and I'm in this particular one, we can see from the front of the airplane, I have a 4.65 decibels of square meter kind of a thing, 2.9 square meter. On the side, you'll notice I'm 4.7 square meters, and in the back, I'm 2.9 square meters. Now, the cool thing here is if we go over to our F-104, and I go ahead and open this one up real fast, you'll notice that he's a little bit smaller in the nose. Uh, he's got a 2.7 square meter uh, nose here. His side is 6.5, and his reader is uh, 2.7, so it's actually slightly smaller than the F-16. Now, what did that 0.3 mean? It meant at this distance, of course, I picked them up at 200 in, uh, remember, 207 for our F-16, I'm sorry, 211 for F-16 and 207 for F-104. So that tiny, tiny, tiny little difference in meterage, I think that's not really a tag, how about square footage? Uh, square meterage, sounds good to me, um, basically made the difference of three nautical miles at 250. Now, of course, if you sit here and do, uh, grab a calculator and do 207 divided by 211, you'll see that's a, about a 2% difference in range, which uh, technically speaking is not nearly as much as you hope it would be. Now, the other thing you probably observed is I had a copy of these two aircraft actually uh, flying these big, big kind of uh, funky polygon shapes around here. And you'll notice they were detected at 215. And then our F-104 buddy right here was actually detected a little later in the scenario as he started to round this corner. The reason for that, that these were detected at a longer range is because they exposed more of their side. Now, the big thing you want to notice here is their range when they were detected was about 212 and about 210 respectively, which meant that even though we were showing the sides, the only real difference in range detection here was like two and a half nautical miles, which again, if you want to go ahead and get that out again, woohoo, 209 divided by 213, boop, that's uh, once again, 2%. 
So the key important thing that you need to know about that is just because you've changed your aspect doesn't necessarily guarantee you're not going to be detected by these really, really, really high powered early warning radars. Now, another thing you probably observed is the fact that I have some of the aircraft flying away from this particular radar. And you're probably saying, what's to do with these guys? Uh, one of the big challenges for any radar systems is, of course, uh, filtering out clutter. So one of the simplest ways they can do that is they can use Doppler shift or Doppler information. You know, basically, if you pick up a target and it's getting closer to you because the um, radar waves are being Doppler shifted towards you, you know that you probably got an airplane and not you know, a tree because trees generally don't come at you at 500 knots. Uh, the reason that's so valuable is if I'm flying 10 knots off the ground, the only thing Doppler shifting is going to be us. And that's how one of the effective methods we can, to, again, to detect the F-35, for example. Hmm, it's a 600 mile an hour mosquito. I think that's an F-35. Of course, you wouldn't want to go those speeds, but that's okay. So anyway, uh, one of the common problems is, is to actually filter out anything that is being shifted away from it electronically, and they allow it to be concentrate on things that are moving towards it electronically in order to basically filter out stuff that's getting away from you. You can't really get a shot on. So the interesting thing here, and I find this very, very I don't know how I feel about this, because again, we don't know the actual minutia of the calculation here. But a lot of times uh, when you read the quotes of uh, Soviet radar design, or basically any radar design, receding targets are harder to detect because we're not looking for that particular type of shift. We're looking for a shift that's coming towards us. So if I actually were to go like this real quickly, and I let these targets speed towards the edge, the interesting thing here is once they hit their maximum range, there it is right there, you'll see that they hit a maximum range at about 211, which was almost exactly the same range that we detected them coming at us. Now, again, one of those things, I don't know much about the P-37, but I know in some other systems, receding targets are harder to detect. Just not something I'm going to worry about. The key number that we need to know, though, is when it's running from us or coming at us, its square meterage is about the same. So let's go ahead and I'll reset our scenario here. And now we're going to show you just how we can exploit this by causing some frustration for our opponents here. So let's go ahead and re-enter our scenario. Now you probably saw these other three airplanes chilling. I'm going to grab that one real quickly. I have my radar inconveniencing device. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip on my radar inconveniencing device here. Now the inconveniencing dice, of course, these are noise jammers. There's a lot of different types of jamming. I'm not going to get into it. I actually read a really fun book about that about a month ago. And they were, it's, <laughs> at the very least, um, I'm glad they simplified it because it's so insanely complicated how uh, these radio things actually work and how the different frequency agility and the types of noise and the modulation. And it's, it's incredible when you really get down to it, but um, be glad that it's simplified. So anyway, let's go ahead and unpause. Uh, my radar immediately is of course, going to say the word jammed. And now the reason it's going to say jammed is because someone sent it the raspberry. No one dare gives me the raspberry. No, but the problem here, of course, is it's a very, very powerful radar, which is why I picked it. And it, even though it's jammed, finger quote, that just means it's receiving jamming. It doesn't mean that it can't see. Now, if this were a 1950s radar, the display would be spaghetti, like pfft, kind of spaghetti. You know, that kind of a thing. But uh, we don't have that kind of an issue, so we don't have to worry about it too, too much. So right now, of course, the uh, close range targets we detected, no problem. And then if you remember our next set of targets that we picked up a few moments later, these were the ones that had their sides to us. Now, if I control V real quick, you'll probably observe the fact that the line of sight between those targets and my jammer isn't fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that jammer real quick. Again, this is what I love. I really wish we had drawing tools. Uh, Uncle Demetrius, please bring us drawing tools. Uh, one of those kind of a things in here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and control V again. So now the jammer is between these chaps and us. So the one reason our jammer is not actually appearing right now is the fact that this jamming is so effective, it's just coming out as lines right now. He knows there's something out there, but he can't actually identify even where it is. Now, what I want you to observe here is these two aircraft have dropped completely off the network here. The jamming is just so effective that we just we can't see them, even though we have that nice, lovely side aspect to them. So if we go like this again, if you take a quick look, you can see my jammer is kind of between the two. And we've lost them completely. So what's going to happen is, as I speed up time a little bit, oh, you see we can reacquire them. And the reason, of course, being here is that my line of sight has actually shifted a tiny bit here. We're actually able to see more of the target as it kind of goes around the corner there. So, of course, if I drop these two targets and I speed up time again, we'll allow them kind of to do their piece. You can say, oh, oh, got them again. And now you can see we've reacquired them as we're slowly getting our way out of that very, very powerful beam of jamming here. And we just picked up another air contact. That's the one we had before. And of course, in a moment, we're going to get the other two, which are going to appear in just a second. Notice we still haven't picked up the, oh, there they go. Yeah, we're having a heck of a time with this, but that's okay. Meanwhile, notice these guys are now a distance of, look at this, 216 nautical miles away. And I think, what, about 210 or something like that. Watch what happens when we get within that little detectability cone. Remember, it was like 207 last time. 
We'll give it a few moments, speed up time, oh, and there we immediately have this one. So we can see here that he was picked up at a range of 202. Notice what happened. Because my target had a significantly less um, square meterage, that's my new term for it, we now weren't able to detect it until it was a whopping seven, five or six, seven miles closer to us. Now remember, if we want to do the math on that, let's get out a yield calculator here, 202 divided by 212. We've actually knocked 5% off the detection range of our particular aircraft because we're showing our nose to it plus the jamming. Now, the reason that that works so effectively is we've basically gone ahead and created a situation where our target here now has the noise plus the smaller square meterage. This is why jamming plus stealth is the greatest thing ever invented. And it's also one of the excellent strategies that we have at our disposal with later types of aircraft. Now, if I pause for a second here, let's give us a few moments for our little F-104 to show up. Oh, F-104 hasn't even showed up yet. Hey, get over here, F-104. There he is. Notice he was not detected to 187. Boop, 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 What was it, 207, I think it was? Bam, 10% detection reduction. Now, 10% does not sound like a lot, and um, I can do the math on that real quickly here. It's not much. It's 20 miles is basically the difference, if you want to work it out real quick, 25 miles. But um, the key thing there is, if you're trying to get in range of like an S300 or something like that, that's a big difference if you're trying to get something like an SDB or a JASM kind of off the rack before you break and run for your lives as all the, you know, basically radar-guided missiles come dropping down on you a couple moments later. Now, we'll also take a look at another aspect of this that's important, and that's the jamming aircraft themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to order two different paths. I'm going to order this guy to come right at it. I'm going to grab this guy, and I'm going to order him to do this. <laughs> you can see exactly what I'm doing here. And I'm going to grab this guy, and I'm going to order him to go like this. Yeah, you see what I'm doing here? It's exactly what I'm doing, see? Of course, in the real world, though, when we take these corners, these corners will be a little bit more aggressive. But again, we just want to take a look at it. You ever get the feeling that somebody keeps changing my uh, visibility settings? I swear, every time we get a patch. All right, let's go switch back to uh, blue side here. And uh, we got all sorts of junk on the screen here, but that's perfectly fine. Not worried about it. I'm going to go ahead and speed up time here. And we're going to take it and take a look when we detect all of our radar inconveniencing devices here. So for the sake of clarity, what I will do real fast is I'll actually grab these guys, remove these fat chaps, move these chaps. That looks pretty good to me. Let's go swing back over to the other side now, and um, we'll go see what happens here. So we'll speed up time. And oh, pause. We are, actually, we don't need to do that anymore. It does it for me. So we see here we have a bogey, and we've detected them at 17 nautical miles. And uh, let's see here. Um, you can see here we've actually picked it up by the radar itself, which is pretty cool. So OK. The key thing we need to know here is that was about 17 nautical miles. That's pretty close. That, that, that's darn close, darn close. Again, if I needed to drop a weapon, they'd be in a lot of trouble. So our other ones, of course, are taking these really, really funky paths, as you recall. You can see one's kind of doing a zigzag, zag and the other one's doing that. So we're interested. <laughs> I love that. This is not a bug, by the way. This is uh, by design, as they say. So theoretically, we should detect that one at a distance less than 17 because of the fact we saw its side aspect. And as a matter of fact, when we get to this point, we detected the target at 22 nautical miles. It's a five nautical miles crater. The reason being is because if you look, we're actually looking at the side. It's, well, it's an oblique of the target. So we're actually able to detect them sooner um, than this one, which was coming right at us. Starting to see the pattern here. And then, of course, if we look for this one, who's uh, doing his little thing there. Oh, there he goes. How much do you want to make a bet? It's 22 nautical miles. Oh, 18. So again, we have a, yeah, pretty, pretty solid oblique there. So you can see here that when you're planning your jammers, if you want your jammers not to get shot down, the trick is to minimize the amount of time that you're actually going to expose the side of your jamming aircraft. So now, of course, if I uh, go ahead and grab one of these, excuse me, guys, I just need to borrow you for a moment. Achoo, achoo. I'm glad these guys have a lot of range. So if we wanted to make it so that we absolutely maximize our jamming capability here, we want to design our jammers in a track that is going to be basically keeping the thin aspect of the target always pointing towards where we want to go. Now, one of the nice things is if I set up a mission to go ahead and make them go back and forth like this, that's really, really, really easy to do. Because now what I've done is I've made an aircraft that basically has a little teeny tiny moment when it's actually exposing its side so that it actually is going to be a more effective aircraft. 
So I guess we've answered a couple different questions here today. Uh, one being, of course, do you make your tar jamming tracks look like this, or do you make your jamming tracks look like this relative to the radar? And the answer is definitely this. Uh, this is going to be superior in every way if you're trying to protect the life of the jammer. Granted, you get less width that way, but again, you can always put parallel tracks together and be very successful. The other thing we saw, too, is even though targets have different aspects to them, we weren't able to didn't make that much of a difference. It was like 2 or 3% until we added jamming when it was suddenly a 10% reduction, which is quite a bit. And that makes a huge difference when it comes to trying to get close enough to deploy weapons. Now, there's one more thing we'll take a look at today. And what we'll do is we'll grab ourselves an F-35. Because science, F-35A. Oh, we'll grab the one from Finland, because why not? Uh, we'll do it internal. We'll, we'll make it very difficult. We'll make it internal. Also, four missiles. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Have you guys played DCS? I'm actually going to delete my jammer here. <laughs> a radar and convenience device. I like that. So we have this guy, and of course, um, we'll track him directly. And we're just going to speed. There he is. Now, I just want to point this out real fast. So our handy-dandy little F-35 here was picked up at a range of 14.9 nautical miles. Did you notice that that range was almost exactly the same as our good buddy, the Jammer? And you're saying, but I thought the F-35 was just so stealthy. Well, F-35 is stealthy, but if you've actually clicked on the F-35 for a second, you'll probably have noticed that when we come down here, that we have a front and we have a side. That also means we have a bottom. And as we actually get closer to the actual target itself, more of the bottom, which is the wide part of an airplane, not the side or the front or the back, starts to become more and more visible. So if I were to actually grab this guy, just to kind of prove my point here, let's go ahead and move him back real quick here, drop him down to low dangerous altitude here. Of course, this has other benefits, like, you know, be able to take advantage of, you know, the surface, you know, the curvature of the earth and all that. Let's go ahead and switch back to this guy. I think this will surprise you. All right, there we go. Let's uh, go ahead and um, drop him because I don't want to see him. Drop it like it's hot. Drop it like it's hot. All right, so we're going to go ahead and proceed. Zoom. Ah, there he is. Ready to be disappointed? Ta-da! It made no difference whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it eliminated, mm, let's call it, uh, I don't know, what was that? Like maybe 8, 6, or 7% of its distant detectability, not even, maybe 5% of its detectability. So even though it does have that wider aspect, it only makes the slightest amount of actual difference. And that's one of the most interesting things about radar. They actually have these things called splat plots where they show you kind of the detectability of an aircraft based on angle. And one of the things that are so classified it's not even funny is the sweet angle between us and a radar detector that would basically make us the hardest to detect, but still allow us to get to that radar. Now, if we had access to that number, oh, uh, we could do some nasty professional command edition version things here, but we're not going to do that just for the sake of, again, being able to see this. Key takeaways, uh, direction of your jammers. Uh, keep in mind, it does make a difference, but it doesn't make a difference. And of course, uh, be mindful of certain loadouts. Actually, let me do that real fast, just so just kind of aware here. So if I grab my F-35 again, just real quick, real quick, real quick. It's important to know that some of these loadouts have they're absolutely massive. Uh, for example, if I take the GBU 49s, look what happens to my square no square noses. My uh, what did I say? Square meterage. I think I call it that. You can see it's massive, but you can see all the other ones when they're internal are much smaller. Enjoy.